three, three number theoretic problems uh, which lead to dynamics and in that dynamics you want to know how spe specific orbits behave. You know that most of the, that there are some orbits that don't behave the way you want them, not equidistributed or, or dense, but you're looking at specific orbits and your hope is, or you're curious, do these orbits behave like most orbits or, or, or not? And um, I must say that uh, uh, the idea that rational, in some sense these, these will be rational orbits and uh, the fact that, that rationality can play a role is actually I learned from Barak, uh, Barak Weiss, who showed me a paper by Raghunath Han in which you can say something about rational points under the action in, in, in homogeneous dynamics. And, uh, um, at any rate, let me begin. Uh, uh, it's not obvious what this sequence is. It's in <laughs> fact the, uh, these, are, these are the powers of five, five halves to the n. Now, I, as far as I know, nobody was ever interested in these powers. But in fact, something similar, uh, and from our point of view, the same, ki same kind of question, you can ask for three halves to the power n. And the question is, uh, if, if we write every number x as being the integer part plus the fractional part, then the question is, what can we say about the fractional part of, these, of this number? That question arose in connection with Waring's problem. You may be familiar with the w Waring uh, conjecture, it goes back hundreds of years. The, uh, um, er everyone knows the theorem of Lagrange that every number can be represented as the sum of four squares. Later it was proved that every number can be written as the sum of nine cubes. And the question is, is there some number g of n such that uh, so that every number can be written as, as gn power, nth powers. In other words, that, that every z can be written as x1 to the uh, n plus etc. up to x gn to the n. And Hilbert proved that there is such a number. That for every n there is such a number, and people have been interested in knowing what that number is. And in fact, there is a, there is a formula for the for the number, which do happens to involve the, the fractional part of three halves to the n. I mean, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's something like, well, at least part of the answer is it's two to the n plus, plus the integer part of three halves to the n, but provided this is true whenever uh, two to the n times the fractional part of three halves to the n is less than two to the n minus the integer part, <laughs> of three halves to the n. Um, so at any rate, the, this fractional part comes in. It shows up somewhere in, in uh, arithmetic. Or math. And so, the question, so you can ask questions about it. And the reason I chose five halves to the n uh, rather than three halves is because I can write down, it's easy to, it's easy to compute the uh, um, powers of five halves to the n because we, we're used to using decimals, we're not used to using uh, sixadic ex expressions. So the question is, um, if one writes down the sequence of, uh, of, pow of powers of, uh, powers of five halves in, in this case, if I look to the right of, these, of this red line, are these numbers, um, are these decimals, say, are they dense in the, uh, in the interval zero, one? So this is uh, the question that we want to address. The question is the sequence, uh, is the sequence fractional part of, well, five halves to the n, dense in zero, one. Actually, I couldn't find the reference, but uh, I believe that, in fact, that uh, no other than Andre Bay showed that the, uh, so in the case of three halves, and it's the same thing here, 
that the, uh, the set of limit points is infinite, which takes a little bit of work. It's not an easy exercise. Um, now, when I've written, I've written it in this form because, the, uh, because there is something special about the way this, the way this um, um, sequence is, is formed. Namely, there is some function, there exists a function um, phi from the set 0, 1 up to 9 cubed to um, 0, 1, 9. You can think of this as a coding um, so that every number, everything that appears here um, is formed from the three elements above it by this function. In other words, for example, this, this 4, if I apply the function to 6, 5, 6, I get, I get 4. And you can see how that is, because multiplying by 5 halves is the same thing, 5 halves x is the same thing as multiplying by 5 twice, and then dividing by 10. Now the dividing by 10 is just shifting. And multiplying by 5 is, you know, you multiply by 5 and then you carry. So that depends on two digits. So, so altogether it depends on three digits and this is the, and you could, could write it down explicitly. It doesn't help very much. But the, uh, um, this is what you call a cellular, what's called a cellular automaton. It's a, it's a dynamical system which is def where the, s the space consists, let's say omega, consists of some some finite alphabet, lambda raised to the z, you know, the sequences in, in elements of lambda, and where you have such a function, phi, from lambda to some power k to, to lambda, and which gives you a coding, so that from each, uh, um, from each such infinite sequence, you get another sequence by, in other words, you define a function this way, uh, let's say transformation of, of omega equals omega prime, where omega prime is gotten by omega prime of n is phi of, of omega at, say, n minus k, uh, k uh, um, well, let's say omega to 2k plus 1, and then from omega n minus k up to omega n plus k. So that's the notion of, an, of, a, of a cellular automaton. We're interested in a specific cellular automaton. And one can show, and uh, we'll see why, that for almost all sequence, or for almost all beginning sequences, in fact, the, uh, um, uh, the, what you get is equidistributed. And, uh, it, well, equidistributed, well, what, what's the measure? I mean, there's a natural measure on lambda to the z where you take every element, you start with a measure on lambda where every element gets, gets the same weight, and you take the product measure, the usual product measure uh, on, a, on a system, on such a space, and uh, for a reason which we'll give right away, the... Uh, um, with respect to that measure, um, this particular operation is ergodic, and so for almost all sequences, you do get you do get equidistribution. Um, there are certain sequences for which you certainly won't. In fact, if you started off with a periodic sequence, then it's easy to see that you're in, the next step is this also a periodic sequence of the same period. So you have a finite orbit. But there's no such reason that the orbit here should be finite. And 
we might consider this a kind of a rational point. Indeed, if you think of these, of, the, of this as an extension of the, of the reals, then the, then the real, the, well, the, uh, the finite, the terms with finitely many non-zero terms are in fact rational numbers. And you could generalize that by saying uh, something is rational if, it, if eventually it's periodic in both directions, and, uh, except for finitely many terms. You could call those things r rational, and then you want to know what can you say about a rational orbit. But one, um, one necessary condition um, for denseness of, the, of what the right-hand side is, turns out that it means that if you look at any of these vertical sequences, they have to have a lot of randomness in them. And that can be defined by, defi by um, say, defining the, um, um, if, if we define the, ra the uh, if we call it the entropy of a sequence, the entropy of a sequence, of, of a sequence, uh, a one, a two, etc. cetera, um, one, w one way is to say you count the words of a certain length, and uh, suppose the lambda has uh, k elements in it, and so you divide the logarithm, you look at the logarithm of the number of words, the number of words of length, let's call that w of n, divide that by log of n. If you had all, if all words would appear, then, I'm sorry, you divide that by log, yeah. Uh, if all words would appear, then you would have, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, it should be n log k. You take the limit of this, this turns out has a limit, and that, if, if all words would appear, you would have n to the k, this would be n to the k, and the uh, log would be k, n log k, I mean, it would be k to the n, and so this would be 1, and, um, um, so, and uh, so then you say it has positive entropy, but it might have even zero entropy. In fact, to check this, to check that, is what, what should one expect in this situation? And there's one, there's one uh, uh, cellular automaton in which one can really say exactly what happens, and we might call that a linear, a linear um, cellular automaton, is where I take lambda to be, if, uh, actually be enough to take a finite group, but I prefer taking a finite field, FQ, and that your function phi is a linear function. Some linear combination, the digit below is a linear combination of a finite number of what you have above it. And uh, you, can, you can determine it, you can say something very precise about this situation. And um, uh, what, as it turns out, the, um, uh, the sequence, the vertical sequences, uh, let's say theorem, in this case, the vertical sequences are coefficients of an algebraic function now there's an algebraic a power series, which is algebraic over um, f q of t, let's say. And uh, <coughs> this implies that if this function will satisfy some sort of equation um, p zero of f to the uh, to the p to the to the d plus p one, the p's are polynomials f p to the d minus 1, etc., to uh, up to p d. Um, and from this, because of the 
fact that raising something to the, or actually meant Q here, P is Q, um, the, uh, because of the fact that A plus B to the Q equals A to the Q plus B to the Q, it's very easy to see what these are, and what you find is that in such a, in such a sequence of coefficients, everything can be written in terms of things that, are, that appear before. Because it turns out that the, um, uh, the f that appears here, the, the coefficients that are, will be appearing here are with, appear to p higher powers. So all you're using, if you're looking up to n, all you're using are, is, is a fraction of those coefficients. At any rate, it's easily seen that this implies, this implies that the entropy equals zero. Um, this idea turned out to be interesting because um, um, because if you do this over if you do this for an ordinary just for the real if you do this for the reals the complex you do the same kind of kind of thing you also get an al you also will get an algebraic function you can try it yourself by starting with a sequence zeros and ones and where your function phi of a, b, c is a plus c. And then you'll see that what you're getting down the middle is, is uh, the binomial coefficients 2n over n. And this function is, is an algebraic function 1 over 4, 1 over the square root of 1 over minus 4t. At any rate, in, in, in this case, it's, it's, well, it's well understood. What's interesting is that if you could try doing the same with higher dimensional cellular automaton, and then you won't get an, you won't get an algebraic function, but the functions you do get turn out to be interesting functions, like hypergeometric things related to hypergeometric functions and, and so on. And in fact, uh, since we're talking about number theory, it's, uh, this, those functions appear in, in Aperi's proof of the irrationality of zeta of three. So, uh, seeing that these have, uh, have uh, entropy zero, occur, it occurs that maybe in this situation we also get entropy zero, which in fact may be the case, but I don't know, I don't, I believe that's not true. I believe that in fact you do get a positive entropy, <coughs> but it's a, a question that could be raised, does one, is there, um, a cellular automaton for which, which the w vertical sequences, or even one vertical sequence, let's say the middle one, um, is has positive entropy. Entropy for a rational for a rational orbit, let's say. Now, how do I know that, in fact, the, that this transformation is an ergodic transformation? Um, but, of course, the, the, the almost every point for which you do have ergodic behavior won't be, need not be the rational points, which are only countable number of them, um, because this... Um, the space is almost, um, um, it's almost the solenoid, um, I, I, see I want five halves, I want five halves to be defined on, on a space, on a group. If I suppose I would like it to be, uh, to be, an, uh, to be defined on, on a compact group an compact abelian group. <coughs> compact abelian group is the dual of some discrete group. So if I have a discrete group in which multiplying by five, multiply and dividing by five, and the same thing for two, are automorphisms. So such a group is the ring Z of uh, one-tenth. And so the dual of this is a solenoid in which you can multiply and divide by and the same way that z hat 
you can identify more or less, not exactly with sequences, say zero to nine to the tenth, uh, um, to, to the n, it's the same way this can be identified with this to the z. Of, ra of rationality, yeah. yeah, rationality. yeah well, um, in particular, if you have if you have a cons constant values, um, whatever a a a, with finitely many exceptions, and then again you have a a a. Um, if you want to, if you talk about rational numbers in in this expression, what you have is something that's eventually periodic, and uh, in this side and in that side, so the. Uh, so I use that, that's the notion of rationality here. And, uh, uh, so these are, these are, this, these are, the issue of this particular cellular automaton and uh, uh, how that behaves and whether altogether you, there are cellular automata for which you can get, uh, for which you get randomness in, in this kind of procedure. Okay, I'm going on to now to another problem. Um, um, this time, um, I'll start with the dynamical, with the dynamics and uh, then translate that into a sort of a concrete problem and you might say a number theory. It's, it's um, not quite as, um, as clear a, a number, a, a, problem, a, a problem that people have looked at in number theory, but um, it still has uh, that flavor. Um, let's take... Um, <coughs> Let's take as our group, or our space, omega, to be the two attic, two attic integers, z, two, this stands for two, two attic. In other words, numbers in uh, the elements in c in omega can be expressed as infinite sequences, say, epsilon n, two to the n, from zero to infinity, um, epsilon n, either zero or one. Um, and I'm I'll define an operation here which, um, which corresponds to the shift. I can define it, in, you might say, an arithmetic operation which co corresponds to the shift. Well, not quite here. Quite here it's very simple. You just multiply by two and you get the... Uh, um, but the, uh, um, the operation... Um, let's notice that uh, that in, in this in in, the, in this ring, I me mean, three is invertible. In fact, you can check that one over three. If I write it as a two attic or well, decimal or so, it it's one one zero. Then from there on, it's zero one zero one etc. You can check that this is one third. So three is a unit here, and so two thirds, which also two-thirds to the n goes to zero, plays exactly the same role as two in these, among these two addicts. And therefore, I can express every number in the form, every C can also be expressed as sigma, let's say, a to n, um, two-thirds to the n. And um, so again, um, we know that the, again, the a, a to n's are, can be zero or one, and, the, and this m preserves the measure. In other words, the, order, the measure, standard measure here is the same as the standard measure there, the Bernoulli measure, the, uh, um, because it, it, it derives from looking at this over the finite, over the finite uh, looking at modulo, modulo two to the n, two to the n plus one, and so on, so the... Uh, um, at any rate, now the shift we know is, is, is ergodic and, uh, and so again, almost every sequence here will have a, den will have a dense orbit 
here, in, the, in fact, equidistributed orbit. But now this can be, um, this can be translated into, into the following form. Now the shift here corresponds to the shift on eta, on the sequence eta, uh, corresponds to taking, multiplying three times the greatest integer in C over two. Now what is C over two? Well, you can talk about C being even or odd. If the first element is one, then it's odd. If it's zero, then, you can, then it's twice some other number and you can divide by two. So the greatest integer is, is C minus epsilon zero divided by two. And epsilon zero is, is going to be the same as, as eta zero, C minus eta zero divided by, by two. That's the greatest integer. And then when I multiply by three, you, you can see that this is corresponds to shifting this. Now this is an operation, again, which I can do on ordinary rational numbers, in particular on ordinary integers. I can look at, um, I can look at this operation and ask, do I get do I, what kind of an orbit do I get? Well, sometimes it's easy to see that, say, um, suppose I start with three, then this goes into three times the greatest integer and three over two, so this goes into three. So you have a periodic uh, uh, point, a, period, uh, a, f a finite orbit, and you can give other examples of rationals which produce a finite orbit, but um, if I start with an integer, if I start with uh, um, here, uh, let's say, let's take C, let's take, well, let's, let's call it, um, let's call our beginning number, say, Z. If Z is an integer bigger than 4, then you can see that T of Z is bigger than Z. And so, therefore, the orbit is going to be infinite. T z is less than t of z, um, it's less than t squared of z, and so on. So this is an infinite sequence of integers, and so the orbit has to be infinite. And so it has no reason to be different from, um, different from almost every orbit. No, no good reason. And so, we call it a conjecture that in fact it's equidistributed. Now, what would that mean? Uh, it means, in particular, whether, the, whether it's odd or even, whether it's an odd or even number, that, uh, that, that acts, acts like a coin tossing. As if I take, let's say, let's say five goes into, um, becomes a six, goes into nine, goes into um, three, uh, 12, goes into 18, goes into 27, and so on. And let's write a one whenever, whenever it's odd, zero whenever it's even. This sequence, I claim, let's say if I want to make a conjecture, I claim that this is a, this is a Black Bernoulli sequence. And this has the statistics, or you could say, call it a uh, normal number. You know, every, particularly every combination occurs. It's a nice exercise, not, not really difficult. Um, show that this sequence is not uh, exercise. Show that this sequence, this sequence of zero, odds and evens, zeros and one, above, is not, you, know, you might call it pre-periodic or ultimately periodic. So that's all I know about, all I can prove about it's not, it's being ran, uh, random. It's not periodic, but, um, now, uh, this could be useful, um, if this is really true, this would, the, people work with what they call quasi-random numbers, quasi-random sequences, which behave more or less like actually random sequences, and if, this, if the conjecture is true, this would be a, a truly random sequence. And people would, one would like to know how to manufacture it. The trouble is 
that these numbers grow so fast, they grow exponentially, so it's not really a practical way of, of, of producing such a sequence, but um, it would be a, some way of producing an exactly random sequence. Let me go on to the third example. Um, which um, this has to do with the notion of well approximability of, of numbers, in particular. Um, um, in particular, well approximability of, of uh, algebraic numbers. So let me review for those who are not familiar with the notion. Um, uh, every real number can be approximated by some rational, by arbitrarily large rationals, uh, that is, uh, it has arbitrarily close approximations for which C minus P over Q is less than 1 over Q squared. There's an argument of Dirichlet. You look at the, you look at the multiples N, C. In fact, you take a fractional part of this and you see that there's, it clusters, has to cluster together at a certain rate and that, that gives, ends up giving you this, this approximation. So every number is approximable to this to this degree. Some numbers can, you, you can do better and we say that uh, C is well approximable if um, there exists <coughs> for every epsilon we could then uh, for every, uh, I'm sorry, uh, every epsilon, <coughs> there exists P and Q with C minus P over Q less than epsilon over Q squared. And here we're dealing with, we're interested in irrationals. For rationals, you get, you get this to be zero. It's not an interesting question. But for, it's interesting for irrationals, whether they're approximable or not, well approximable or not. And one can show that almost every, almost every number is well approximable. What are examples? Well, it turns out that uh, um, C has, every C has, an, uh, um, has a continued fraction expansion let's write it as d0 plus 1 over d1 plus 1 over d2, 1 over d3. I write d because these are called partial denominators. And it turns out that the number xi is well approximable. I mean, you get a good approximation to xi by just cutting this at some point. In fact, that's when you get, that's when you get this approximation. And from that you see that if the d's get arbitrarily large, then the number is well approximable. If it's not well approximable, then, uh, um, then these d's are bounded. So in particular, if the d's are periodic, then the number <coughs> won't, be, won't be well approximable. And in that, those, those numbers are, in fact, quadratic irrationals. But that fact can be seen very easily, directly, say the fact that the square root of 2 is not well approximable. If I multiply this by the square root of 2 plus p over q, I get absolute value of 2 minus p squared over q squared, which is 2 q squared minus p squared divided by q squared. And this is always bigger than uh, let's say even equal to 1 over q squared. Because this is never 0, and if it would be 0, then square root of 2 would be rational. Anyway, 
you can do this with any quadratic irrational and so there's a very good reason why quadratic irrational should should behave in a special way and the um, um, so the question is what about other algebraic numbers and here nothing is really known as far as I'm, I'm aware as you know <coughs> do they maybe they're all badly approximable or maybe some are and some aren't um, or maybe they're all well approximable uh, so in the spirit of these other questions um, or other questions which have been dealt with by dynamics, one wants to find a dynamical system which could answer, to, could, one could start take a, find a dynamical system for which this question has an answer. Well, no, say this cube root of two or something like that. Um, well, there is a dynamical system which leads directly to the continued fraction expansion. It's a well-known transformation on the, your spaces, then the integers, the, the interval, zero, one, but minus, you have to t subtract the, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, omega. Minus the rationals. Um, now there's all the irrationals and the operation x goes into um, 1 over x minus the, in, you know, the fractional part of 1 over x. That's exactly what gives you the continued fraction expansion. So what you want to know is an orbit, if you take start out with a number and then um, uh, you look at its orbit, if it comes arbitrarily close to zero, it can't get to zero, but if it comes arbitrarily close to zero, then the number is well approximable. So here you have a simple dynamical system, and can that help us? Well, the question is, how, how, do, how can you possibly distinguish between an algebraic number and a non-algebraic number if with, this, with this transformation, with this discontinuous transformation? So the, um, um, in general, approximation, approximability has something to do with lattices. And I want to, the, I want to take advantage of the fact that the, an al a number is algebraic if it's, say, the, uh, if it's an eigenvalue of an integer or, or a rational matrix. So I, I would like to put the, um, put this question in terms of something involving matrices and let's for in order to make it concrete let's suppose let's suppose that we have a matrix A in uh, um, well belonging to matrices well non-singular matrices so let's make it GL GL3 of R and I want to say something about well approximability of the eigenvalues of this, of such a matrix. And the, uh, um, and here we have, we could, the space to look at, uh, the space to look at is the space of, uh, let me first write omega prime. Let this be the space of two lattices. in uh, R3. What do I mean by a two lattice? Um, is, is something of the form uh, Z U plus Z V, where U and V are, are vectors, independent vectors in uh, R3. So the um, um, G alpha the, the group, let's call this group G. So G acts on, on this space. Obviously, it takes a two lattice. Mm -hmm. no. You have this in space. And, um, it, um, and um, I want to identify two lattices um, 
um, I want to identify two lattices if I get one from the other by dilation. So let's say that lambda is equivalent to lambda prime if, um, let's call this, um, all right, if uh, u equals some multiple of, of u prime, v equals some multiple of v prime, the same, the same multiple of v prime, then I say that the lattice z u plus z v is equivalent to c u prime plus c v prime. So I'm interested in this space. Now the space modulo this equivalence relation. Uh, um, this space is, uh, this will be my omega. So omega prime, epsilon to omega. Omega can be expressed as g mod gamma, where gamma now, a matrix belongs to gamma, will have the following form. Basically, I'm, I look at, the, at this subgroup that fixes a particular lattice, and so it would be a matrix of the form, um, let me write it as R times P uh, S zero T, where R S, well R, um, R and T are non-zero, uh, non belong to R star, um, and S belongs to, is any vector in R squared. And one sees that this preserves the, the lattice generated by the vectors 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. And um, the R just dilates it. And so here we have a, we have a homogeneous space, which is not, uh, is, is, turns out it has, um, well, it, it, it's non-compact. Even though I've, I've, I've made the, uh, I've introduced this equivalence relation, it's non-compact because, uh, just because of the fact that the space of lattices that, uh, that appear, um, um, I can, there's something that's known as the shape of a lattice, of a two lattice, um, and that the set of sh the set of shapes is non-compact. And this is all very elementary. And um, just let's look at a lattice, and you can assume we can because we're allowed to dilate, so we can assume the smallest vector is length one, and let's turn it so over so that. So that this is the smallest vector from 0 to 1. And then let's look at the next vector, the next to the smallest vector. It can't be inside here. If it's outside here, move it till it gets inside the circle. And so what you find is that, is that the next to the smallest vector is somewhere here. And you can call that point the shape of the lattice. Essentially, it determines the shape. Any two lattices for which there's the same point are similar. You can get one from the other by similarity transformation. So as a result of this, uh, um, this, space, this space that we have is non-compact. You can see that it's a question of go things going out to infinity. And maybe later I'll talk a little bit more specifically about how measuring the height, how high you are. Um, the, um, and using that, we can see what, why this would have something to do with, uh, um, with Diophantine approximation. But now one has the, uh, um, the following theorem. Um, so we have this matrix A. Let's denote by H the centralizer of A. of A. Now we're going to assume about A that assume that lambda 1 bigger than absolute value of lambda 2 bigger than absolute value of lambda 3. And now here I'm th assu I assume that all the eigenvalues are, are real, but they could be positive or negative, and so I write absolute value here. Um, 
then uh, okay, let uh, okay, so theorem. Uh, I'm going to look at um, I'm going to look at lattices that have the form that are generated um, lattices of the form I'll write it this way generated by some vector u and a acting on u. Now the point is you could you could talk about a rational point in this space if u and if u if u is rational then A, because if I assume that A has, has rational value in entries, then this is also en rational. <coughs> so you could consider this, the, I'm, I'm looking at the class or the, um, let me write bar to refer in, uh, w uh, with this equivalence relation, then uh, I, I would call this a rational point. And the, um, so the th but the, the theorem has nothing to do with rationality at this stage. It just says that if um, if lambda one is well approximable, let me write it belongs to W A, stands for well approximable, then the orbit of any any uh, such point, u, a, u, is unbounded. And on the other hand, um, if lambda 1 is, is badly approximal, if it does not belong to w, a, then not only is the orbit, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say the orbit under what, um, When you're under the group A to the N acting on, on this point, this is unbounded. And on the other hand, if lambda does not, does not belong to WA, then the orbit of, again, the same, of any, or, um, I'm sorry, then the orbit of some, <coughs> <coughs> no, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, I have this wrong, the orbit of some, Think recall. No, I think it is in fact any. But if it does not belong to W A, then the orbit of um, every U A U under H under the bigger under the bigger group is bounded. So the um, strategy, I mean, uh, the approach one would have is to try to show that it's not possible that these are, that this is bounded for all, uh, for all, everything in the group, in the subgroup H. But so far, no, this hasn't, this hasn't worked to prove the, uh, to prove the conjecture, um, the, uh, the natural conjecture, I would say, that if something doesn't have, if a rational orbit doesn't have a good reason to behave in a special way, then it'll behave like almost every point. That's the, so the, an approach that yields conjectures. It doesn't yield proofs, but it uh, <laughs> yields, yields. Uh, when you say any U, any U, any U, any U, where does U vary? The U, it, it turns out that the U doesn't matter, but the, uh, the point is it doesn't, in both of these statements, it doesn't matter whether uh, you can restrict yourself to an integer u. And that would make the orbit, in some sense, the, the orbit of a rational point. And um, 
I tried, the, tried using Raghunathan's idea with his theorem about, about a certain orbit being closed in the case of rationality, and that didn't work here because the, um, because the subgroup gamma uh, is, not quite, um, uh, is not quite discrete because of this S that appears here. The, um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say what P is. P, P belongs to SL2Z. So it's partially discrete and partially non-discrete. And if it would be entirely discrete, then everything would work out very easily. But because of the not, because of the, because S can be anything in, in R2, um, so that the technique doesn't work. And uh, um, so that's um, where things stand. I could mention some other questions that relate to this, uh, say, um, um, Now there's another strategy that can be, that one can use. Um, we have the notion of, uh, of, the, of the shape of a lattice. So say lambda is a lattice, we have the, the shape of lambda. And then we can call, we can define the, the height, I said the mu of lambda as simply the y coordinate of the point inside that modular region. I call that the modular, modular height of, uh, of lambda. Of lambda. And now given a vector, um, given an integer vector, and here's where integers, objects come in, suppose that v belongs to z cubed, an integer vector, then the, the vectors that have this, the, um, if I take the orthogonal plane and intersect it with z cubed, it's non-empty um, because there always are, I mean you can show, it's an easy exercise, there always are integer, integer vectors orthogonal to, a, um, to an integer vector fact that you can solve linear equations over the rationals with rationals. It's, uh, and in fact, what, you, what this is, this is a lattice. This is, gives you examples of lattice. And you can ask, you can talk about the modular height of this lattice, and we can assign that to, to V. So let's call that nu of V is mu of V hat intersect Z cubed. And so you expect that for um, this function, it's an unbounded, certainly an unbounded function of, of V. And people have studied what can you say about the Vs in, um, on a certain subvariety. For example, on spheres, what can you, suppose you look at the integer vectors on spheres, what can you say about that? And it's been shown, in fact, that the shapes tend to be more equidistributed in the, in the modular region. The, um, so the question, a, um, if the following, the following uh, possibility would help our, um, our problem, um, if the orbit, uh, let, uh, let now H, similar to H, before let H be um, be a rank two subgroup of uh, int subgroup of uh, say SL SL three Z um, a commutative. Those I have two um, two matrices A and B which two integer matrices A and B which commute, um, and they're not powers of the same, say, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the same matrix, and, um, <coughs> excuse me, and 
V is some vector in Z3. <coughs> um, uh, can um, um, is it for um, for every <coughs> excuse me <coughs> for every k arbitrarily large um, and um, well for given and we're given yeah we're given the vector v so there exists an h in um, in the in the group capital H with this uh, this index with nu of v larger than k. Now is that the H v. No, H v. Now in some sense the the orbits under H get around enough to get the this new uh, this new parameter arbitrarily large um, this would imply if this were true this would imply the the conjecture the uh, the conjecture about that the uh, um, that the uh, again in in this case of uh, of an integer matrix a um, that that the orbits would be the orbits are un, unbounded. These orbits are unbounded. Okay. Thank you. Do we have questions? Yeah. Will this last conjecture imply that the cubic algebraic are well? Yeah, right. Now, if this were true, that would imply that uh, uh, cubic, well, cubic irrationals satisfying the condition. In other words, real, uh, uh, I mean, I have, simply haven't looked at the other case, uh, having real eigenvalues, no, yeah. totally real uh, eigenvalues.